Good day, Mike. Hey, thanks for agreeing to have this conversation with me and let me record it and then share it with others. Uh, before we start, could you please give us all a little introduction, a little background about yourself and L&D, and, and uh, give us a, a snapshot, an overview of this research on transfer uh, that you've been doing uh, as you work on your PhD? I thank you for allowing me to have time today to kind of kind of talk to you about my research on the uh, transfer of uh, learning or training to on the job performance. Uh, as we, uh, as I wanted to share with you a little bit about that, but I'd like to give you some background about myself. Um, I'm my background is uh, kind of a unique perspective to bring into uh, this industry in the sense that uh, you know my initial career you know, uh, post-college was in social work. I have a master's in social work and I had an opportunity to work in children and family, uh, uh, working in children and family services in the state of Washington uh, and then kind of transferred into uh, doing hospital social work uh, and working in the ER and in the psychiatric unit. And lastly, uh, I decided to explore the world of domestic and international adoption. So, and so then I decided to make a career change because one of the things back in the day, I, I wanted to be, do educate, become a teacher. And so I've always had a, a, a desire. And so as a result of that desire, I spoke with uh, uh, a friend of mine that run, ran a consulting business and she, and she said that, you know, why don't you come on board and you know, and she encouraged me to get a certif certificate in, in learning and design and technology from the University of Washington. And I became a course developer. And then my interest in it to, uh, so when I was building courses, you know, all the instructional design and stuff was done. And so I just had to build it, whether it was in uh, Articulate or Adobe or whatever platform it was. But one of the things like I have a curiosity and I wanted to know why uh, the she as the instructional designer was making the choices she did that she took the content from the client and created this training. And so my curiosity said, I need to know the why. What are all the things behind the decisions that an instructional designer makes to develop a, uh, a training that's engaging, that you know, that captures the learner's attention and wanted to know, you know, why, you know, how do you look at evaluation of the, of that training? And so, um, I was encouraged to get a master's in learning design and technology. And I have that from Purdue and it was uh, a great experience. And then, um, one of the things that I've learned through my 13 years now as an instructional designer, project manager uh, organ of an organization uh, is that, you know, you work with clients and they like to evaluate at what I will refer to as Kirkpatrick's a model, four levels of models of levels one, uh, the reaction and level two, which is the knowledge or learning. And, but like to have levels three, which is the application of the learning to on the job performance. And then how to, you know, measuring the impact that training has on the organization and the clients that we worked with, none of them really ever desired to go past levels one and two. And so being a curious learner, I decided to kind of wanting to get a, a PhD uh, and so I started that journey in August of 2020 at University of Hawaii, Manoa. And, uh, and my, uh, what I'm interested in is, is that, you know, the why organizations evaluate that transfer, because I know that there are some organizations out there. And then there's a lot more organizations that really desire it, but, uh, but don't put it into practice. So you have this gap between desire and actual usage. And so I wanted to understand how organizations, you know, how organizations that actually did it, what decision process did they go through to make that decision to take that step to actually start evaluating it? And then also look at the methods they did, what technologies they used. And then lastly, how did they ensure that they were able to look at 
um, the business impact of that training or a curriculum of trainings. So what I did is, is that, uh, and I apologize if I end up kind of t- talking too academic right now, but I decided I wanted to look at, uh, you know, doing kind of a mixed method study, which combines you know, quantitative, which is is what I used, was a survey that I published through ATD and also through ISPI and Training Magazine. And then uh, I collected the um, the information from that. I cr- uh, kind of created a uh, survey instrument that allowed me to a- get the answers to the questions of you know of that you know evaluation at levels one, two, three, four, and actually levels five as well. Return on investment from Jack Jack Phillips, and so then out of that, I ended up interviewing a qualitative uh, process of interviewing nine uh, individuals that had agreed to participate in those interviews. I ended up kind of stratifying it into organizations that were small, medium, and large. And so I got three of each and had a great conversation with all of those uh, participants and organizations. And there were uh, organizations in uh, the military, uh, big uh, Fortune 500 companies, medium organizations, and organizations that were from you know under 500. And so I got to understand the processes they go through to evaluate uh, at each level, I was able to uh, talk to them about the processes they go, uh, go through to uh, talk with their key stakeholder before, as they begin the process of the journey of developing courses, you know, asking them specific questions to determine that they're able to measure at uh, level three or and and help determine the impact. So, um, you know, I'm. I'm at the point where I'm uh, going to be defending my dissertation in um, in D- in November, and I'm excited that um, uh, I ha- you know I feel like I've got some really unique findings from the perspective of the barriers, and uh, and if you let me know if you want me to stop and I can just keep talking about where well, my research, you know, guys. So, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about, you know, the, this whole issue of transfer of learning, transfer of uh, training to on the job performance, because from my perspective, there are, you know, I'm looking at, you know, how organizations measure, measure it, but there's a lot of, a uh, lot of other factors that that you have to look at that impact the success or fail success or failure of that transfer, you know, based on, uh, you know, the, uh, the transfer training model that, um, uh, Bald, I think I'm I'm drawing Baldwin <laughs> in 1988 created, and there's other partners with him, and so I'm drawing a blank on the other person's name. Uh, but anyway, so you know you have to look at the learner and the cognitive choices that the learner makes to accept or reject certain aspects of the training. And so, for example, if you have a 10-step 10, 10 process for a call center rep uh, and that they have to follow each time and they were trained on that and then when they get back to training, the supervisor listens to that call and goes, okay, well, you did steps, you know, you know, the learner did steps one, two, three, and then went to six, seven and skipped nine and went to 10. So the question is that really hasn't been explored is why did the learner skip those steps? And so, uh, so that the cognitive choice that the learner makes. And so then the other uh, big thing is, is that is the work environment and that they label. And, and there's a lot of different, you know, components of that, you know, like the organizational learning culture. What, what, what is the message of the importance of training coming from the uh, higher levels of the organization to, uh, support the training, explain why there is a need for that training and to understand the importance. And does that message get down to the frontline supervisor and explaining why they have that? And then the biggest factor from my perspective is opportunities to use that new training. And specifically, how soon does that learner have an opportunity to practice it? In my research, it, 
what determines what, what determines success or failure is the time element. At what point does the learner get to actually apply that new knowledge or skills? Because as we know that there is a learning curve and when a person leaves a training, as I mentioned earlier, they make a cognitive choice to accept or reject the training. When they leave the training, they're excited to start using the new tools or new processes. And then, however, if their supervisor doesn't really say anything and now or allow them to use it, that, you know, that learning curve drops steeply. And so the success of that training will go down accordingly because the opportunities to use. So big picture, you look at the role of, you know, the of time and organizational support that comes from the, you know, the suite, you know, the management's upper suite, and then down to the lower managers, supervisors, and working together as a team versus the whole concept of mentorship with other workers that are more senior that have buy-in into that new training or processes. You know, so, you know, this transfer of training is even though I'm looking at one point, one little aspect of this in my dissertation, I understand that there's other aspects that really impact whether or not that success. And then lastly, there's another process that the more opportunities the learner has to use those applications over the first year, um, there's more success that that learner is going to retain that because over historically, a lot of the research has said that there isn't a lot of research on post, you know, post training, you know, typically the, what we, what I found in my research, it was like two to two to, four, you know, two to four, six months. That is all the evaluation. So there's nothing really post training to observe, demonstrate that there's long-term memory application that you can look at applications in post training, you know, uh, that six months or longer based on, you know, if they're actually asked to create a, do a process to create a widget. You know, you can look at errors and things like that, but, you know, the area, that process, uh, Doc, uh, Brian Bloom created a dynamic transfer model, which says that there needs to be multiple attempts for the learner to do it. And then an evaluation taking place when after that, you know, assessment that's done or evaluation that's done by the supervisor uh, or a trainer to ask them to talk about you know, what, you know, that acceptance or rejection of that knowledge, skills, or attitudes that they have to have to make the decision. And the key point is, is that what do you do with that acceptance or rejection, especially the rejection? Because in my opinion, that rejection will help that training and development team to create a training that will provide a better process of acceptance in the long run. So that's kind of what my uh, research is about and one specific area that I'm interested in is is that because I was curious about what are the barriers that organizationals face and so um, what prevents organizations from making the decision to evaluate at Kirkpatrick's level three and Kirkpatrick's level four which is business impact and so you know, if you'd like me to continue, I will continue, guy. You know, I, well, as I said, how how can I help you? What 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 would you? What was your interest in talking to me about this? What can I do for well, you? Well, you know, because of your vast knowledge, you know, and being in the industry, um, you know, I'm curious to know, you know, you know how, you know, from your perspective, how do you work with organizations or work as a, you know, honestly, I work as a consultant. Sure. You know, how do you how do you get your foot in the door, you know, to, you know, like, for example, you know, I have I believe that I have a, a good knowledge set about this process and I have a clear focus of what what needs to be done. You know, what are, as I call my dad used to call the low hanging fruit that or that organizations can do in the training development department to help get to that level of being able to measure that uh yeah did the transfer take place and was there a business impact even though the organization might not ask for that because a lot of organizations i found in my survey um and my interviews they you know it's 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 they all it's like in essence it's a nice to have but a, not a need to have 
So, you know, it's like, how do you prepare yourself to provide that information when that moment comes when somebody says, you know, how can we make an impact? Because there's a lot of organizations in in the uh, ec economy right now that are looking at, well, we need to cut. And so, uh, you know, there's organizations go, well, you know, in my experience as a consultant and in what I've in, and as an educator, you know, training and development is one of, is a is a nice to have, but not a need to have. And so, you know, I'm just looking at what's your what's your lifelong experience, and if you know what questions do you have of my research that I've talked about, or the barriers that you know, how can I, as a person that's coming, you know, out of the industry, I still like working doing an instructional design, but I have this skill set, you know, of you know of evaluation. You know, I have a passion for evaluation that. Um, you know, how do I mark, how do I market it and how do I convey it? And, and actually, honestly, how do I get in the door? You know, it's like, yeah. I'm a big Hamilton fan and it's being, how do I get into the room where it happens? Well, so there's a, there's a lot to cover here. First of all, I think that uh, we on the supply side and our customers on the, uh, and those on the customer side of the equation come for, to, to this too often with an educational mindset where we don't know what's the application of the learner back on their jobs, because maybe there's a whole variety and we can't cover all those applications because we, whoever's conveying, doesn't know what the application is. And Bob Mager, the late Bob Mager, talked about this in the mid eighties at, at an NSPI conference, now ISPI. And he said, why are we still arguing decades later about the difference between education and training? You already know the difference. And he said, for example, your child goes off to college and they write home, being the 1980s, they write home and tell you that they're taking a sex education course. Or they write home and tell you that they're taking a sex training course. Well, the entire room erupted. And of course, he said, see, you already know the difference between education and training. So our clients don't often expect this. And our L&D leaderships don't want to delve into that because perhaps they're doing communications to make people generally aware, or they're doing education to make people knowledgeable, and they're not always doing training, even if they call it training, which basically uh, enables people to use awareness, knowledge, and skills in some authentic job tasks to produce outputs that are authentic to what's required back on the job. So too often we're not doing uh, a training. We're, you know, now we've got this umbrella term learning as it covers everything and it, you know, has so many meanings, it's almost meaningless in my view. Um, but I'm, I'm a training guy. Now I would call it nowadays, I wouldn't call it training all the time. I would call it instruction as another umbrella term because instruction covers both what I call performance guides, what's been known as job aids, electronic performance support systems, performance support. It's instructional in that it guides the performer in how to perform, what to do, when to do it, how to look at the situation, decide which path to go on, whatever, depending on the complexity of the performance. Training is also instructional. Education is also instructional. And a lot of communications is instructional as well. So there's those two sides where, where either the performance context, and this is how you make the decision as to whether I give people job aids or training, um, does the performance context demand a memorized performance response? On demand right now, no time to look anything up. You know, you better have it in the, your head and in your skill set, your uh, et cetera. And, and so either the performance context that the learners are going back to demands a performance response that's memorized or their performance context allows for a reference performance response where they can say, hold on just a second, let me look that up. Oh, here it is. Okay, now, and then they can perform. So we need to understand that performance context so that we can uh, help people learn and master the behavioral tasks, 
the cognitive tasks that go before, during, and after the behavioral tasks, because the behavioral tasks we can we can see, we can monitor, we can measure, we can count them. The cognitive tasks, we can't do that because, you know, it's just you can't, you know, see pe what people are thinking. They can tell you, and they're usually wrong uh, and incomplete is what the research shows. So we need to understand those tasks, both types, and understand that those tasks are a means to the ends of producing a product, an output, or rendering a service that some downstream customer uses. We produce outputs that are inputs downstream. It's kind of the quality movement model, uh, which is very familiar. It's inputs, process, and outputs. Now, the late Gary Rumler and the late Dale Brethauer put another box beyond outputs that was called the receiving system. So that's the customer. And you either meet their needs with your output, which is their input, or, or not. And there's a bunch of feedback loops. And one of those feedback loops is a consequence loop. Like, I don't like the products you're giving me. I'm never doing business with you again. I'll find somebody else. And so that's one type of consequence. So when we produce a learner who has learned something, their receiving system is the job itself. They go back to the job. And now we have to understand as uh, instructional designers or learning experience designers, um, what is that context, that job context, that performance context that people are going back into it? And and will it be accepting that Guy has learned some new things, some newfangled things that are different than the old fangled things? And what, is that system going to accept that or reject it? And so let me back up now. So when I start projects as a consultant and I try to convince my client, the requester, to form a project steering team of their customers, their stakeholders. The training manager, director, vice president, whatever, has got has going to do do a project, and it's you know it's for an audience. And who owns that audience? Can we go up a level or two in the management chain and find people there whose whose numbers as managers? will reflect people performing better, faster and cheaper, or the opposite. So, so we've got them by the numbers and they have should have a self-interest in getting their numbers to look better because maybe it ties to their annual bonus, et cetera, or their career aspirations or whatever. But anyway, so if, if we start talking performance rather than learning, that we're all about improving performance and learning is a means to able to, the ability to perform tasks, which is, the, the means to producing outputs of value that have meaning and impact. All right, so if we talk to our client and get them to form a project steering team, more formal than not, those people can help us by sanctioning our project, making sure that it makes business sense to them, what we're all about, what we're intending to do, what is our terminal objective of this project to produce people who can do X, Y, and Z, and not necessarily A, B, C, or G, E, F, or whatever, but you know, focused on something that's tangible, meaningful to them, and focused on performance, not on topics uh, out of context, or knowledge out of context, or skills out of context, or behaviors out of context, or competencies out of context, but in context, in a performance context, says we're going to improve that performance, not generalities, but specific, uh, specificities. Um, and so when I've when I've uh, successfully for and all the projects that in mind that have failed been, been miserable failures at usually a pretty good price, um, they failed because they didn't have the project steering team in place who could tell us point us to our sources for individual interviews, observations, documents to review. And they could also tell us who not to talk to, who not to observe, who not what documents not to refer to, because they're no good. And how would we know that if we don't live in that world? And so they can take ownership of the project that we're doing on their behalf and their learner's behalf, their performer's behalf. But when we do that, when we have them, we can plan the project with them, show that to them our plans and get them to prove it or to modify it. We can, they can resource our project with the right people at the right time to do the right things because otherwise we're scrambling and trying to pull people out and ah, you know I got bu I'm busy to do other things. 
Well, if your boss's boss has said you will be there and you will participate, it's more likely to happen. Um, the whole notion of, of, of having to, uh, if you have to explain why this training is necessary, something is wrong in the get go of that. You know, why, you know, if that, if the name of the, of the project or the course or the job aid doesn't resonate and scream performance, then something is amiss. And we're doing things, uh, you know, that will involve far transfer versus near transfer. But when I've gotten the project steering team assembled, um, I, I do what a thing I've, I've written about this in a couple of books, and I've talked about this on a couple of uh, 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 podcasts and webinars and such, where I say, you know, in my very first meeting with the client, when I'm showing them the project plan, before we've done analysis, before we've done design, before we've done development, before we've gone to do a pilot test, I start worrying out loud about transfer. And I've had clients and, and stakeholders on these project steering teams say, Guy, you've not even done the analysis. I mean, you're going to go through all these steps here. You said not. You're already worried about transfer, which happens when the dust settles on your project and it goes out and it's being used and learned and applied. Why are you worrying about transfer now? And I go, because it's where everything falls apart and fails. And I said, you know, I, I worry about transfer. So my role is to make sure that I give you authentic instruction, job aids and or learning experiences that will actually help people perform back on the job. What I be always worry about is, will the person that's learned something that's kind of new or very new and different, will the supervisor stop it cold by saying, guy, I don't understand what you learned. I want you to do it the old way because I know how to manage that. I know how to monitor that, troubleshoot that, and manage that. But you're doing something different. I don't, I don't like it. So... Then I would always say, well, my client, Eli Lilly, back in the mid 90s, used to force all of their vendors that whenever they produced a training product, that they produce something for the supervisor too. Because the supervisor needs to understand what the heck has guy learned and what's my job and how do I manage this now? It's, it's something very different than what it was before. Or maybe it's slightly different and I need to be watching Guy when he comes back and look for those nuanced differences and and reinforce that, give him you know reinforcing feedback or corrective feedback because he didn't do it right. He backslid, he skipped those steps in the process. What the hey? And that's my job as supervisor. And I said, now you guys on the project steering team, you own all of these people. They report to you through, you know, successive levers of layers of management or something. And so you're the only ones who actually are responsible for transfer. And that's why I'm worried. I don't know if you're going to be doing your job. And, you know, you got some a bunch of division, uh, say, regional sales managers or whoever they are going, what do you, you know, what? And but but what I've started to say has made sense to them because they've seen this before. They've been they've been in that movie theater before and seen the same movie multiple times. The sequel is the same as the, and so they they are. I'm challenging them obliquely, and I'm challenging them about their role and responsibility. That hey, we on the supply side can produce some stellar instruction. And put your people through that and make give them the initial competence and confidence to go back to the job and apply it. But if that receiving system, that box after pro input, process, output, if that receiving box there is not receptive, they'll stop it. And that means not only do we have to get a positive ROI, we're going to have a negative ROI. We're going to spend a whole bunch of bucks and spend a bunch of time where people could have been doing something else, and it's all for naught. And that's a negative ROI. And that's not on us in, in the in the learning and development world. I mean, we can do our thing here. You can hold us accountable for doing our thing, and we can measure that too. But when we when we can prove that people like it and they have learned it, and then now there's a transfer, that's on you, not on us. And that's eye opening for my clients, for the other people on the instructional team here that are here listening in, sitting into this meeting. And but I'm challenging them that they've got to do their thing, uh, their side of the equation. They've got to work on that to make sure they're transfers. So they need to explain it to their managers and the troops and the learners. They need to expect it. They need to inspect for it. 
and they need to reinforce it by providing positive consequences for the people that are doing it and negative consequences for the people that aren't for whatever reason. And then they can do some troubleshooting to say, why aren't they doing it? Now, one of the things I learned from the late Gary Rummler back in 1981, he speaks on a video that was recorded at Motorola in 1981. First thing he looks at, is there a process? Well, yes or no. If there is a process, are people adhering to it? And if not, why not? He said, the second thing I, I look at, it, because I'm giving the learner, the performer, the benefit of the doubt. I'm looking at the what Deming called the system. What's the system? And so if, it, if you got a process and it's a good one and proven to work and people aren't adhering to it, why not? If they are adhering to it and you're not getting good results, then it's the process. But otherwise, the second thing he would look at is the consequence system. Is the consequence system in place, a formal or informal consequence system, is that inhibiting performance? Is that stopping things? Are we punishing our best performers by loading up so much work that they get, finally get smart and they slack off? And we, it looks like performance is degrading here. Well, actually, no, the consequence system is balancing out because people aren't dumb. They're going to figure out that, you know, hey, uh, you're not giving Guy as much work as you're giving me. Give that slacker more work and, and expect him to do it rather than load it all on me so that I can, through heroics, save the day. So, I mean, there's a lot to all of this, um, but it all goes back to the beginning of a project where you're focused on performance you're aligned with the stakeholders. You are getting pointed to the sources that you should use by those stakeholders. You're getting their buy-in that we're doing this for them and not for us. And quite frankly, too often learning and development organizations are off doing whatever they think is appropriate and nice to do or needed to do, but they're not really aligned and they're not working on things that are critical, the critical business issues as Rumler used to call them of the enterprise or of functions within the enterprise. Um, and if we're not working on those critical things then nobody's got any energy for that. And they may not expect you to measure it because it's education, isn't it? What, what, what do you mean by training? I don't even know the difference. Then you use Bob Mager's little story and they go, oh yeah, I think I see the difference here. Um, but I think you know a lot of this has to do with everything on the front end of your project and not the stuff near the tail end. So that's a lengthy response to perhaps your question, but you know, where do we go from here? What, what have I helped? Uh, what else can I talk to you about? Well, I, you know, Guy, I really appreciate it because it really, you know, when we, you know, one of the first comments you made is, is that, organizations that to be successful in getting that information it takes place at the front end and uh and that kind of actually in some ways uh i want to share some from my findings about organizations today versus you know 10 12 years ago and one of the things is is that i looked at was you know was you know, associate ATD had been doing has been doing this performance evaluation, or you know, organization evaluation, perception versus reality, and other parts of their survey since two thousand. And in uh, what they found is is that you know historically you have this gap between at Kirkpatrick's levels three, which is the transfer of learning, and that business impact, and that you have this high perception level. Uh, of desire, uh, both le at level three, and then you have the this gap of perception versus reality. Okay, and then and then as you go up the ladder uh, of to level four, the the perception still remains high, but the actual usage drops. Okay, and then what I have found in in my research is is that the perception of the uh, perception of the value of levels three and four actually has gone down about 10 or 12% over the 10 years. So organizations are, are valuing less levels three. And similarly with level four, organizations are down 10 or 10 or 12% on level four. 
And so what I wanted to look at is, is that is in the barriers that the uh, survey participant said is, is because, you know, other than I really looked at the, you know, I created, I have like a top 10 of risk uh, concerns, but when I started analyzing the data and I'm going to share some of those and you can probably see a common theme come out. One is, is that uh, I don't know how to go beyond levels one and two. I, uh, my manager doesn't know how to do go beyond levels one and two. I don't know. I don't have the background to do this, you know, and I don't know how to interpret the data. Once I get it, what do I do with it? So if you look at that, those, you know, barriers, and it's really an, an issue of, you know, how the type of person that's being bringing coming into the training and development department that doesn't have that educational background in training and development managers come into their role where they don't have any understanding because it hasn't been taught to them at either a prior organization or the new organization of the role or importance of training. And and it's like um, Cammie Bean wrote a book called The Accidental Instructional Designer. Yep. And I was at the ATD conference and in San Diego in 20, you know, two, two years ago. And I attended Cammie's presentation and there's over 500 people in the room talking to her. Because that's know, who they are. They're the accidental uh, right. trainers, and, instructional designers, et cetera. Right. And, you know, she she flipped the question at the beginning. How many people have a degree, in, a master's degree in instructional design? And there's only about 20 of us that stood up. So you look at the you know, the, the target audience and the assumption that we, uh, that you know, we make that the people that do have the educational background and experience in evaluation, performance improvement, we anticipate, we make the assumption that those people that are in the training development world as, as frontline workers or managers have the skill set. So to me, it's to, to me, the, where the low hanging fruit is, is in the fact of how do you teach and educate those people that are on the front line. Like you said, you know, where, where it starts is the front line. So my question is, is that what are the five questions that you need to ask that you can get to get to those answers, you know, that can help you format that to get to the, what are the five questions? You know, there may be more, but what are the most important five questions that you can ask your key stakeholder, that person that's above the uh, above that person that you mentioned that it really impacts their professional career their bonuses and stuff like that you know that really make the decisions it's not the manager that he gave that to because that that person really doesn't have a stake in the game you know right. well his stake is the fact that he wants to please his boss but the reality is is that getting to that conversation what are the five questions that you could educate you know that you can lay the foundation for that so well uh, so the so the the if you take the addy model and i put a, a planning and project kickoff before the a so so it's really and and before that it starts in the intake process that leads to a project plan which leads to getting aligned with the stakeholders and all that so that they can see we've got a reasonable plan blah 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 and that's why we're going to do analysis and design and development and all exactly. that exactly now implementation and evaluation, the tail end of the ADDIE model, need to reflect exactly what was happening and discovered in the analysis phase, and most people don't see that. I, If I've done my analysis correctly, uh, uh, if I think like a, a, the late Joe Harless or the late Gary Rundler or Bob Mager and all those folks, if you're not focused on the outputs of performance, because everything else is a means to that ends and you know that output so that's an that output is an input so what do people downstream need which is the downstream customer but then we might have regulators that are going to look at that output and we can have you know the the financial bean counters in the enterprise looking at that output to say what were the costs to produce that and what are we selling it at and we're going broke every time we sell one you know so there's a lot of stakeholders but what are the stakeholder requirements for that output do we understand them because that's what how you measure outcomes. Outcomes are either good or bad because we've either met or didn't meet 
the stakeholder requirements because the downstream customer can be happy, but the regulator, the people from regulatory affairs say the regulators are going to invade us and shut us down because of what we're doing or because of how we're doing in the process box with our tasks. We're violating mm-hmm. safety standards when we produce that output. The output's okay. Our processes ain't no good. And so we need to understand the st- who the stakeholders are for our outputs and our process and understand what their requirements are, What understand what the constraints are, because that's how where measures come from. And, and so we can't measure impact if we don't understand that. Now, the, the right. standard quality measures are usually articulated as quality, quantity, and cost. In layman's terms, it's better, uh, better, faster, and cheaper. And so, you know, however your language talks about this, if you don't understand, go find yourself the quality people or the business process people and figure out what does your enterprise use as their measurement metrics use those don't introduce any new things that you learned at some learning conference because the world that you go back into doesn't care what the learning conference folks told you about measurement go figure out how we're measuring our business processes if we're in manufacturing or merchandising and or in healthcare how is the business measuring itself and that's one of the reasons why you form this project steering team with the stakeholders because they can tell you because they know because their numbers their bonuses their careers are based on built on them hitting those numbers or exceeding them and they worry when they aren't meeting them for whatever reasons because the sun didn't come up today and now their numbers are bad and it's not in their control but they know what those numbers are and so we can't always control everything but we at least need to know how score is kept in our business and and so if you don't because if you don't know how score is kept you don't know how to play the game you don't know how how to make the maneuvers in order to get a better score and keep the other team from scoring or wh- however that should be looked at but but so we need to understand that and when we don't understand that we can never really measure successfully impact now in 1979 when i joined this field I have a radio TV film degree and no official background. The people I went to work for had been working at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Detroit with Gary Rumler's brother. And and so they were learning things from Rumler and Gilbert because they were the uh, place where things were experimented with because they could give Gary's brother this stuff and he would try it out at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Detroit and they would see, does that work or not? So they came at things uh, with this this particular mindset. And when I learned about Kirkpatrick's four-level model, which isn't supposed to be levels, but, but that's how the world has taken it and reconstructed it, they told me, they taught me that we start with level four, impact, which by the way, was ROI back in 1979, because that's how our clients measure ROI. And that's what the impact, now you can have a couple of calculations to get to ROI, and that's all in that impact box, if you will. So we start with there, and if we're getting what we wanted, good, we don't need to do any other evaluations because evaluations are expensive. And why do we wanna incur expenses when we don't have to? So we measure the impact. We go back out to the world of work and we see, have we improved from the baseline that analysis established? When we go out to evaluation, we're looking at the same dang thing, things, and we're looking to see, did we get better quality, better quantity, better lower costs, uh, uh, better, faster, and cheaper or not? What, what shifted in those numbers? And if you go, well, there's too many dynamics in that world of work for us to attribute success or failure to the training, well, then we we rolled it out in pieces and we did a little experiments. We rolled it out here and seen whether or not th- that improved compared to the rest of the operations that were going on, if, if, that, if your situation affords you that. Um, but so you can look at the very same things using whatever numbers are for quality, quantity, and uh, costs, Uh, by talking to the financial folks, by talking to the quality people, by talking to the business owners, or you can shortcut all of that by talking to your project steering team, who are the managers who know what those numbers are, because that's what they live and die by. And so you can get aligned to that. So when you're doing your analysis, when you're doing your project planning, when you're doing your intake, you can figure out what are the numbers, what are the metrics that we would hope to affect. 
what does the client wish to affect and all of that. Because later on, several boxes later, that's what we should be looking when we look at evaluation. So, so that's the begin with level four slash five, if you will. When you look at three, well, did it transfer or not is the question, right? Well, what would be the earmarks of something transferring or not? It's those same numbers being impacted. So there's one thing that, that is key when you look at transfer. Guys learn something and he goes back out on the job. So a little short, a story here from my days at Motorola, and I happened to be able to uh, have this ability. Uh, this uh, I was able to work with uh, Neil Rackham, who wrote Spin Selling, or the best selling book in the history of selling books, uh, sales books. And uh, he was. I was meeting with my manufacturing operations managers, the top of the manufacturing world at Motorola. They made stuff. These guys made it. The engineers designed it, but yeah, but we we made it real. And I'm talking to them about the fact that if that my thing has always been, uh, everything that I produce is going to be 60 percent on practice with feedback. And they were going, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make you know, that that, that takes up too much time. You can't put 20 pounds in a five pound bag if you're going to do all that practice with feedback stuff. So they were always at, at most thinking one and done. Try it, and that's so. I was struggling with this group. Neil Rackham was in the room with us and they already didn't like him because these are manufacturing folks. And Neil's standing there, uh, a mid-height kind of guy with this uh, goatee and this three-piece tweed suit with a British accent. And they, they weren't too sure that they liked him when he said hello and we all introduced our, each other. And he interrupted and he said, uh, do you, any of you guys play golf or tennis? They all did. He said, have you ever had a lesson? They all had. He had them. He just knew how to do this. This was masterful to watch this. He said, did, did they change your grip? Yes, every one of them had the, the coach or teacher, trainer change their grip. And he said, so what happened to ball control when you first went to use that new grip? Oh, it went here, it went there, it had no control. He goes, so then did you revert to the way you always gripped it? golf club or tennis racket and they all stopped because they knew that he had had them he had just walked them right into his trap and they all said yeah that's what. so he said the see the the coach which is what guy is talking about with his practice with feedback the feedback comes from a coach who is not looking at the initial results he's looking at the behavior the correct grip and guy, you 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 change your grip here. Keep the grip. Well, but the ball's going the wrong way. Well, keep the grip. Keep the grip. Swing, 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 swing. Pretty soon, the results become reinforcing of the new behavior, and that's what the job of the coach is. And so, guy wanting to do more than one practice exercise is really all about that. We want to give people the initial competence because they've got ball control with the new grip. And we need to reinforce that. Um, and so uh, this whole notion that that when we look for implementation, we might see that guy goes out to the world of work, tries what he's doing and struggles a little bit. And that's when the supervisor will step in and say, guy, maybe you better do it the old way, the way you used to do it. Cause this is worse than you went off the training you came back worse than you, you know? And so that's something that's a, barrier to successful implementation. I mean, it can get out there and get started, but then uh, be stopped cold by a supervisor or the peers that I'm working with on the work team or the customer who doesn't understand what's guy doing that's different, do it the old way. So there's many people out there in the performance context that could be part of the uh, uh, stoppage of the new thing, the new process, the new behaviors using new knowledge, new ways of doing things or slightly different things that are perhaps nuanced, but the initial results could not be acceptable. So maybe we have to go back to rework. So, so there's that. And the only way you can counter that is if you have the equivalent of the project steering team or the managers all aligned to this is the right grip and the ball control will be faulty to begin with, but it will soon work out and we'll have better 
ball control and distance and accuracy um, if we stay the course with the new thing. And people have to believe that. And they also have to expect that we're going to see some issues with, you know, trying it out. Because maybe the training, the learning didn't cover everything. And guys learn some things, but he has to go out there and now retrofit it into his performance context, which is different than everybody else's. And so they couldn't cover all of that and the nuances of what guy's going back to. Because, uh, Mike, we, we don't have time to cover your stuff because we're going to, you know, cover what Guy's world is like and, and make sure he's prepared for that world as best we can. And so you can't. So there's some learning that happens back out on the job through trial and error, through social learning. You know, we're, we're not in control of that, so we don't know how well that happens, how quickly that happens, how timely that happens. But we've got to expect that because that's the real world. And if this is you know, the equivalent of guy blowing up the city of Detroit because he's, well, then we, we, we bring all forces to bear to make sure that everything is, that there is no slippage, there is no backsliding, that, that everything is in place for guy to do that. And we've taught him like we would teach an airline pilot for a commercial jet that's going to haul 400 people back and forth. We make sure that they know everything that we're doing. We've simulated their real world of work hundreds of times before we let them take the wheel. But most work isn't like that, it doesn't have that kind of risks or rewards. And so we don't attend to that. So that's another thing, too, is that when we look at our project, we need to look at the, the stakes. What's at stake? Is it high risks, high rewards, which are just opposite sides of the same coin? Or is this medium stakes? Or is this low stakes? Or is this hardly any stakes at all? And therefore, we shouldn't treat every project, every learning opportunity, every learning challenge as if they're the same. We need to look at it within its context, with what, what's at stake, who the stakeholders are, what their requirements are. Because maybe if guy screws up, the regulators shut the whole business down. Well, that's significant. <laughs> and we really need to do that one a little bit differently than we did one where, ah, he's going to have to rework that. It's going to take an extra 15 minutes. Um, and so the analysts at the front end need to be prepared to go in and dig that all out and, and come to the right conclusions. And the people that pr planned the project and gave Guy either half a day, two days, five days to go do that analysis, they needed to know, how do I size this for the project plan so that I can estimate my, my schedule and my costs and all of that. And so that project plan depends on the intake process and whether you clarified the request well enough and figure out all of the issues and nuances of the requirements and the constraints in this project that you might undertake. Now, there's a lot of talk also in our business about, you know, don't be an order taker. Well, Joe Hartless, the late Joe Hartless spoke about this in the mid 80s. A lot of cool stuff happened in the mid 80s because people were darn frustrated that the things that they'd learned in the 60s, 20 years later, <laughs> Like, what, nobody learned it? Huh? And so, so this is the repeating cycle that we're in. Um, but he said, you take the order and you do an analysis. And then you let the, what I would say, you let the analysis chips fall where they may. And if your analysis is done adequately and focused on performance, and you found out that it, it's not the knowledge and skills that are our deficit, it's the process is broken and faulty. And if people are taught to follow the process and they do, then woe is us because it's a no good process and that needs to be fixed and maybe you need to train other people on it. So when you get a request, the first thing is, is this for new hires? Oh, sure. Duh. They, of course, new hires need instruction and training and all that. Is this a request to solve a performance problem? Because what the data shows us is 20% or less of performance problems are due to individuals' knowledge and skills. Deming said, the late quality guru, who was a statistician, said 94% of problems are due not to the individual, not to the teams doing the work, but to the system. And and the people like uh, the Rumlers and Gilberts and, and Magers and Harlesses and all those folks would say, it's about 20%. 20% of the requests that we get for doing training stuff 
ain't, you know, is going to be solved, addressable by training, but 80% of it is not. So if we go down the training path, produce training, implement it, we're not going to see impact. We can see that everybody got it, is using it, it transferred successfully, but the impact isn't there because it was the process. And people are doing the new, the old process just like we trained them when we should have revamped that process and they should be doing the new one. And if they did, then we'd have impact. So that the front end and the back end of our methodologies, our processes, our practices are tied together. If And the secret to all of it is a focus on performance, not on things out of context, such as a topic. We want you to talk about this, uh, this behavior. Oh, this, this, you know, customer service behavior you know, or however, whatever is articulated, or these competencies, and now we're into skills and skills mania, where we're going to what? Address skills out of context? Well, that's called education. And we're going to give it to people and we're gonna we're gonna pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, we, we did it, we nailed it, we got those skills out there and we can see, we can measure that people learned them in class, are using them out on the job, but it's not having any impact. Well, eventually, you know, learning and development leaders shy away from measuring levels three and four because the things, the data that comes out doesn't reflect well on them. And they don't know how to work with their clients and others to see what are the variables of performance, including knowledge and skills, but beyond knowledge and skills that we needed to attend to. We needed to figure out was the gap that's going on rooted in those other variables or is it is it knowledge and skills are a gap and some of the other things people are working with bad data and they've got faulty tools that's what's at the root of it and people don't know how to say that's bad data or that's good data and that's a good tool or a faulty tool maybe it's a combination of things and since sometimes train you know this is what they used to say is that you know, we have all these non-instructional interventions and then somehow training gets dragged into the middle of it at the end because we realized, oh, we've changed the process, we've changed the tools, we've got new data. People don't know how to work with that. We're going to have to train them. So training becomes a part of the solution set and it looks like it's always involved. So maybe if we just do the training part, we'll have success when actually it was a bunch of other variables that were addressed. It's it's a challenge. Um, people don't do evaluation. They don't measure impact. They don't measure transfer because they don't know what performance tasks and outputs they should be looking at and how the real world of work measures them in their context, in their enterprise. And and that takes a partnership to figure that out. You can't come in as a new instructional designer, new learning experience designer, and figure that out all on your own. And if you're begging and borrowing, trying to find people to work with you and help you on these projects yourself, you may get the wrong person. I At Motorola, I had a project where I brought in my analysis report. On the front cover, I had the names of the six people that were involved in my analysis effort. These are the people that I work with. My head client saw those names and threw the binder across the room. There were 30 people in the room there with me. I was kind of embarrassed because that made my my product ain't no good. <laughs> he said, this is garbage because I had the wrong people. And I learned a very valuable lesson that day that from then on, I'm not picking anybody. You pick the, the people, the sources that I'll use, the people. You want me to observe something. You tell me where to go and where not to go. You tell me which documents I should look at and which to avoid. Or just tell me the people to look at and the places to observe and the documents to look at. And that will be my set of inputs into my process. And for clients who didn't like analysis, because one of them said, this, the same guy that threw the binder across the room, he had said, Guy, we hate it when people like you come back to us 90 days later and tell us what we told you on day one. He had had bad experiences with people in the training business doing analysis. They brought back a bunch of data and it didn't mean anything. It didn't do any good because they were focused on something other than performance. So I started with him and the people, 30 people in the room right then. I said, okay, so 
these new supervisors you want me to train, what do they produce? What are some of their outputs? They're doing stuff. What are they producing? And where does it go? And who cares? And so we started looking at the outputs that people produce. And we looked at the tasks. And I asked them, so, so this one output that you're, unsatis- you're not satisfied with, everybody's not doing it well. What's the cause of that? Because you guys are in manufacturing, you know root cause analysis, you know some of the quality tools and all that. So what's the, at the root of this? And they said, "Gee, we don't know. We're too far removed from that. Um, but that's a darn good question, and maybe you should go do analysis and go figure that out." And I said, "All right, name the people that you want me to talk to across the thirty different locations of operations in North America for Motorola." And I'll go talk to those people. So tell me your best people who are doing this job already at a stellar level. And I'll go talk with them and figure out what they're doing. We'll try to get everybody to be like them. And then you can measure whether or not, because you, if you measure on the front end in analysis, here's the baseline for those operations, the products produced, the tasks performed, the quality, quantity, and cost metrics. And we've established a baseline for the current state post-instruction, post-training, we can measure the deltas in terms of what changed. And if it didn't change, we can swim downstream from the four levels, from four to three, and go, did it even transfer? No, it did or it didn't. If it didn't, why not? If it did, and we're still not getting the right stuff, maybe what they learned was no good. Maybe we were focused on the wrong things. Let's swim down to level two. Did they even learn it? No, some of them didn't even learn it. That's why it didn't So we can start at the end, begin with the end in mind, level four slash five, then go to three, then go to two, and then go to one. Because if guy is really happy with the training, but doesn't learn it, doesn't transfer, doesn't have an impact, who cares whether guy was engaged and found it to be a fun experience? Well, we're measuring activities and not results of the results of uh, transfer and, and impact. And Too many organizations are just routinely doing that. One, because it's easy, it's cheap, and it gives us some level of self-assurance or something that says this must be good because they liked it and they learned it, which are the easiest things, but not necessarily the meaningful things in terms of getting to impact and ROI. Exactly. You know, if I can add just a little brief comment about that is is that you know what i found in my research that uh about 35 percent of uh of every every 35 percent of all courses that are being created actually have that conversation so you know it it does show a gap between what what we believe is the correct state that you've talked about the process that begins with you know looking at level four and working your way back that, you know, only, you know, a third of every course is being developed is, is, is doing that process. And so, um, and that's one of the things that, you know, we're kind of talking about is, is that grabbing that low hanging fruit and looking at the barriers that L and D people have today, whether they're frontline or managers in their department is not knowing how to ask the right questions and ask who is the right person to talk to in doing that. And honestly, as you mentioned also, is is that, you know, it's taking what you learn either at a conference and what what, what are the immediate things you can do as a manager or a frontline worker that can apply it to what you're doing on the job. And that's, you know, kind of my thought is, is that you have, what are the questions that you, what are, you know, simplify it. What are the five things that you should ask, you know, that key stakeholder. And yeah, so, time, Rum- so Rumler has those questions. Joe Harless has 13. Rumler's I think is seven or eight or nine. But yeah, those questions those, yeah. have been around since the sixties. This is what's right. so sad. Right. Exactly. There's nothing, there's really is one of the things that I look at is in my research, there's, you know, you, you go back in history, you know, you go back, you know, you know, post World War II, and you can even go back, even go farther back to uh, Thorndike and identical elements and things like that in 1901. But there's, 
as the old saying goes, there's nothing really new under the sun. Right. And so it's, but you have this whole new generation of L and D professionals that have come up through the process because they are, you know, they, um, they were, you know, they were, they can do a PowerPoint and they, they're a good you know, speaker. And all of a sudden they're asked to be in the training department. And so, and the same way with managers, managers get promoted because yep. they show up every day, they've done their job that nobody's complained about them. And all of a sudden now that person is now the training and development supervisor or the training development de developer. So it, to me, you know, one of the epiphanies that I had was, is that, you know what, it's, you know, how do you get them back to the basics? And, yeah. you know, <clears throat> so a lot of the basics aren't really being addressed or not. So we have so much churn in our field that if you go to conferences, a lot of the content in a conference is, churn, is aimed at targeted at the new people that are coming in, because that's the largest, you know, body count wise uh, that you have at a conference. Not always true, but, but that's the perception. So one of the things that the old guard used to say at NSPI and ISPI is that there's nothing for us here at this conference. It's all geared to, beginner level, intermediate level, but there's nothing for the advanced level. And then you put on something that's, you know, advanced and everybody that's <laughs> beginners and intermediates go to the advanced stuff because that's where, you know, they think that's that's how I can accelerate my my trajectory here through the, you know, my career. And, and so we also have then marketing people. Uh, my saying is, well, I know what's old is new again. Everybody is taking old things repackaging them slightly, changing the language in the, of the labels and the imagery that is how it's presented and presenting old stuff as if it's, you know, brand spanking new, new and improved. And that's not necessarily true. And so people coming up the learning curve and the performance curves in our field have to contend with the fact that some people call it the, others call it the, and I'm not quite sure it's the same thing. And it's this or that, which looks like, you know, it's really the same thing, but they're calling it this and these other people are calling it that. And is that is that different or not? And so because we don't have a common vocabulary, and this was a complaint in 1979 when I entered, so it ain't going away ever. So you're everybody has to contend with the fact that that's just the real world. I, but if you deal with your customers internal, you're going to find that they talk different languages on the East Coast and the West Coast than in the South. And so, or in this part of the building and that part of the building. And so we're all, as part of our, uh, a test uh, for us is to demystify all of that noise and distill it into its essentials. And that just takes time in, a, in an enterprise, in an industry to figure out the industry lingo and what and what the lingo is in our company because we may not be consistent with the industry for whatever reasons well we got something proprietary we're going to call it something slightly different you know because we're going to brand it and market that way and that just all that causes confusion and so one of the key things i think that makes people successful is their ambiguity tolerance the fact that they can walk into these situations that are very confusing and they can give themselves uh have the patience to figure it out and be bold enough or brave enough to say by when you say the word this do you mean what they're saying when they say that and it is or it isn't you know and and try to not and never ever ever talk in the jargon of our business that you learned at the conference talk in the language of your customers um, because nobody wants to learn our lingo and we should work really hard to learn theirs and to use their labels because we might call it analysis or discovery. And our engineering organization that works with our customers calls it something else. We should adopt and adapt ourselves to their 
language, the language of our business or our industry, so that people can go, oh, I know what you mean by that. Yeah, of course you'd want to do what you were calling analysis just a little while ago. And I hate that because it's analysis of paralysis, but we call this up front here customer requirements. And so if you're going after customer requirements, guy, that's okay. That's a good thing. But this analysis stuff or this discovery stuff, oh, put a hex on that because you know we don't think we like that. So, but that's our challenge. That's what we're always going to be faced with. Um, and so we just have to help new people coming up the curve, the curves of performance and mm -hmm. of knowledge and skills, the learning that they've got to do in order to perform. And we need to make sure that those curves mirror each other and in fact collapse and they're really one in the same curve. We're trying to learn things so that we can perform in our context and and that's you know that's the the secret i think that that leaders in l d they need to be putting in the philosophies the processes and the practices to help their people be successful you can't run your l d shop as an artist colony where everybody's going off doing their own thing their own way you need to run it more like an engineering department where there are rigid but flexible processes to help people be successful Sorry, again, that was another uh, no long worries. answer or comment. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. That's all I, I got. I just, yeah, I just wanted to just kind of concur with you is, is that one of the things coming out of uh, academia is, is that one of the things that, you know, I have been, you know, that I have to remind myself is to, as you mentioned, is to kind of take it from academia down to the level of where the practitioner is at so they understand they're not going to know about the transfer training model. They may not know Kirkpatrick. They may not know Major. They may not know um, you know, Bloom or any of those other people that, you know, as people in academia uh, know. And you have to kind of bring it down to, as you mentioned, that common language to where it connects with them at that level. We can't make that assumption that they know, you know, yeah. all the major, all these people. And, you know, like you mentioned, you know, like how you, we can have this conversation and you're quoting all these different people and sharing the stories from Rumler and, you know, and all that. And so, you know, you have to, because we're, we're looking at one of the things I think I have kind of uh, made it uh, kind of ascertained in my work research is is that we're coming into a different workforce and that we have a different workforce in learning development it's not just at the lower levels anymore guy it's also permeating going up the up the process you know the managers uh the people that are workers are saying that their managers don't know how. And so what does that tell you that, you know, that is it going up in this is that it's, we talked about the work environment earlier, the importance of organizational learning culture. And, you know, like you mentioned about training the training, the supervisors on the front line to, of the importance of this training, what is the benefit for the organization? How is it going to make your job as a frontline supervisor easier and more productive for your crew to do that so it's it's just that you don't know it's like how how far is that permeated up over the course of the years um you know as to where but but none have... of that is but none of that is new mike so the complaints back in this in 79 and in the early 80s was about the same thing here we have the peter principle you know everybody rises to the level of their incompetent till they're incompetent um and man managers in training and development functions before they became learning and development functions um, didn't know these things either. You know, there were very few educational programs in instructional systems technology, you know, and, and everybody today goes technology. Well, that's digital and computer stuff. Cool. Well, no, technology means the application of science and it had nothing to do with computers until it all got meshed together and now a lot of people the old guard goes okay it's about digital tools no it's not it's about the application of science what do we know about you know so the whole science of learning thing is not new either these guys were talking about this stuff in the 60s and the 70s and it's all of a sudden like you know it's what's old is new again it's got a different label on it 
performance engineering, learning engineering. These are things that Gilbert and Rummler talked about in the 60s and 70s. And so this is this is not new, but 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 new people are coming in and it's a constant um new discoveries, rediscoveries. Did Columbus discover America? No, people were already here. You know, but so we got that same kind of silly, stupid mindset that that and 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 so it's not that it's important that everybody needs to learn from the you know the old guys that are no longer with us and and what they said and how they said it. Um What's really and and so, and what they called it because we call it something new and and hipper to much to today you know it's it's just current and what was important about what was known back then is really and this is what's lost in some of the new stuff when does that work and when doesn't it under what conditions does that really work and under what conditions won't that work and you shouldn't even try to go there with it that's what's lost when we call things new and improved and brand new and we don't drag along well this is where that came from and we don't need to go into long histories of those things but we can shortcut it to it's under these conditions where that will work if you don't have all those conditions go build the conditions to make that work or find a different thing because it ain't going to work under those sets of current conditions and so that's what's you know, when does learning work? Well, when the learner is going to learn something well that was designed well to be efficient and effective and goes out to a receiving system, the workplace, where it's going to be anticipated, expected, reinforced for doing these things a new way. Well, how do you make that happen? You may have to train guys, peers, and his boss, and maybe even the suppliers and customers on both sides of the equation, and give everybody to understand that there's a new way to do things. There's a new sheriff in town, and that's what we're trying to implement. What's in it for everybody? Who takes the hit? Because not everybody wins when we make changes. So this department is going to lose big time, and they're going to have to step up to that and gear and resource for that. It's going to take them more time and effort for them to do this. But in total, we win because we reduce quality. We've improved quality, quantity, and reduced costs. But except in that function there, they took the hit. Their costs are going to double. Did we anticipate that? Has the rest of the world realigned itself to that? Or are they going to get beat up by their management chain because their costs are out of control? So performance is complex. It's not a simple thing. And the more we are engaged with the stakeholders, the more that they can point us in the right direction, defend our actions, rationalize our actions to the other group. Hey, you're going to have to double your budget here. Yeah, and we're going to go to bat for you and with the big guys to make sure you get the doubled budget because otherwise your lack of resources is going to screw up our process here and we can't all win if you don't get what you need. And so systems thinking <laughs> is key to this. But God didn't make many people who can bat from the right side of the plate and the left side of the plate and be switch hitters. So we need to collaborate, cooperate with other people to build somebody and have a team that can bat from the left or the right, depending on who's at the at the pitching mound. And so we need to really understand things in as a, in a systems framework and understand the people we're trying to train come from what Deming called the system. And we need to make sure that the system has everything in place, not perfectly maybe, but adequate to the needs of the process to produce products and services that meet the stakeholder requirements, the downstream customers and all the other stakeholders too. Because you can meet the needs of the downstream customer, you can meet the regulatory requirements, you can meet the union requirements, but you can bankrupt the shareholders because you're having to sell at below cost and that ain't no good. Exactly. And, you know, you know, I, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity today to uh, allow me to we talk with you guy and share my passion mm-hmm. for the evaluation of the transfer learning and business impact. And, uh, you know, it's been a great opportunity and, you know, I have a, you know, this passion about it. And the importance of everything that you said, you know, is, you know, you know, spot on. I just feel that uh, trying to get the message out 
is yeah. is that the, what you, what you're talking about is is how do you how do we as training development learning development whatever you want to performance improvement how do we get the message out because uh, in my conversations with organizations they've run you know I've heard at conferences and things like that that you know when it comes to budget crunch time they you know they're saying you know what you know I'm not I wasn't able to do show that there was some impact or return on investment therefore my budget got cut by 10 20 30 40 or even completely yeah and I mean, it's happened all the time and you know, I think if Rumler were alive he'd say because you weren't focused on performance you couldn't measurably demonstrate that you impacted performance and so therefore you're maybe seen as a motherhood apple pie issue here and you're not really seen as a contributor but when you're truly focused on process performance like the quality people are focused on process performance and you are using measurements on the front end and the back end to show your differences and when you've got the transfer happening and you got the impact but the whole system the rest of it is not in in alignment then you may not get the ultimate enterprise results you want so you've got to really ca you know cast your net wider engage more people in this to, to, to help yourself be successful. So this, but being, you know, the sacrificial lambs at budget cutting time when it's necessary for the organization to survive, if you're not seen as being a va value add, if you're just a an expense without uh, generating value well beyond your expense, then you are subject to being some of the first to go when budgets need to get tight. Um, it's nothing personal. It's just business. And if we don't have a business mindset to focus on the business that we're in and the products and services we render will forever be the first ones that get cut. You know, there are other departments and functions and aspects that get cut as well. But, but training and learning has always been that because way too often, most of the time, we don't really prove our value because we're not focused on those terminal results of the business and seeing them in terms of how they align with our project efforts. Exactly. And I'll just end with this thought is, is that, you know, when, when I first started to have, you know, the, our discussion, I talked about the importance of being able to, even though your organization may not be asking you to do that measurement, that's but be prepared to, by asking the questions to those key stakeholders, you're getting the, you're, you're obtaining the knowledge so you can develop the training to be able to measure the transfer and the business impact. Right. So it's being, don't, don't wait until you're asked, just go ahead and do it. Right. There's lots of stories that can be told about saying you can't show, you know, impact. Therefore we're going to cut your budget. Yeah. So thank you. I appreciate your time, Guy, and I have enjoyed sharing my passion about training and uh, performance improvement and evaluation. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for uh, inviting me thank to you. into this conversation and allowing me to record this. Okay, thank you.